Hello everyone. Thank you for attending the sixth episode of Careers Launch Online. My name is Molly. I am the team lead for diversity at UK SEDS and I'm going to be the host for today's panel, um, which is titled A Space for Black Voices. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of UK SEDS, we are the UK's National Student Space Society. We're a group of students and young professionals running a variety of space related events and competitions across the country. Uh, we also operate an early careers website called spacecareers.uk whose team runs this webinar series, which is designed to educate on careers in the space sector. You can find all of the previous webinars through Space Careers UK website or through the UK SEDS YouTube channel. Also, a recording of this panel will be available on the UK SEDS YouTube channel shortly after it concludes. We'll be holding further webinars in the coming months, so do keep an eye out for those. Follow us on social media for more information. Uh, we'd also love to hear from you during the webinar. If you're on Twitter, make sure to use the hashtag careers launch online. And if you scroll down on this website, we have a live chat for you to interact with each other. You can also submit questions in the Q&A box on this page, and we'll be selecting some to ask our panelists today. Today's webinar will be a panel discussing um, and exploring the career paths and experiences of black students and professionals within the space sector. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, October marks Black History Month in the UK. This month in particular is a time dedicated to raising awareness for the vast contributions made by black people to British society. However, it's also important to reflect on the prejudice and discrimination still present and recognise one's own privileges. There are some amazing resources out there. So um, I highly recommend, you know, educating yourself, finding out more about Black History Month. Um, and I encourage you to support black scientists and content writers. Um, I I highly recommend checking out Astro Noir. Um, their website has some really great articles and resources. Um, and I'm pretty sure all of the panelists here today have heard about Astro Noir in some capacity. Um, so yeah, highly recommend checking them out. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our four amazing panelists for today. Uh, we have Ashley Walker, um, Dr. Cyan Proctor, Hayley Harrison, and UK said's very own Chanel James. Um, so Ashley, would you be able to kick things off and tell us just a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are now, what you're currently working on, anything like that? So, um, hello everyone again, my name is Ashley Walker um, and I am an astrochemist and planetary scientist. I am the founder of Black and Astro, which kicked off um, back in June. I am the co-founder of Black and Chem and Black and Physics. Black and Physics is starting tomorrow from October 25th through October 31st. Um, I That's one of the things that I'm working on is black and physics. Um, I also um, am working on science communication, which I do quite often. I talk about um, social justice activism within the science community, within the astronomy community and how we can better um, advise black and brown students and retain them in our fields. Um, I also studied Saturn's moon Titan, which is a very precious project of mine. I study the um, stratospheric ice clouds um, and looking at its chemistry and how we can understand them better. Also studying its, their uh, Titan's and uh, aerosol analogs. Um, for my senior thesis defense. And so um, if I didn't mention before, I received my bachelor's in chemistry from Chicago State University this past school year. Thank you very much, that's amazing. Um, and next, uh, Dr. Siam. Uh, yes, hi, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Siam Proctor and I'm a geoscientist. My undergrad degrees are, I have a bachelor's in environmental science with a minor in mathematics, a master's in geology, and a PhD in science education, well, curriculum instruction with an emphasis in science education. I have been a ge geology or geoscience professor for the last 21 years at South Mountain Community College in Phoenix, Arizona. So I teach mainly geology, um, classes, but also sustainability, planetary science, life in the universe, uh, and environmental science. And so, but um, I also like to uh, dabble in the space industry, I guess you would say, as a geoscience professor. 
I have lived in multiple moon and Mars simulations. So I've lived in the high seas habitat twice. I've lived in the Mars Desert Research Station, and I've also lived in the Lunaris habitat in Poland. I was a finalist for the 2009 NASA astronaut selection process. Mainly most of my research involves educational research, how people learn and process information, at, especially for non-science majors and also very similar to what Ashley was talking about, science communication and how students, how we get um, non-science majors to communicate science better through um, their learning experience. Thank you very much. I'm so glad we have multiple science communicators today. It's so important that, you know, science communicators are out there. Um, Haley, if you'd like to go next, that'd be great. Um, so I'm Haley Harrison. Um, I'm from North Carolina. I'm currently pursuing a doctoral degree in nanoscience. Um, my bachelor's degree was in physics. My master's degree was in earth science. And I study incorporating nanoparticles such as boron nitride into different low density materials. So all my research is space focused. Um, because I'm a grad student, um, I just kind of, I'm always pitching my ideas to the space industry. And so like one of the things I'm really working on now is aerogels. So that's really fun for me. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and last but not least, Chanel. Of course, that would take a bit of a long time. Um, <laughs> okay, so I am Chanel James. I'm one of, I'm part of the diversity committee in UK SEDS. I'm currently studying a master's in astrophysics at, in Barcelona, but I did a bachelor in earth sciences, geophysics based at UCL. And during then I did my dissertation on Mercury, the planet, how the planetary formation and the electromagnetism that they experienced there, um, not they, <laughs> the planet experiences. Um, I have worked for FDL NASA in my second year. I also have worked with CERN in my third year. I currently do quite a lot of science communication as well. And I'm a, working as a freelance journalist for Physics World. And I've started my own website, Astro Noir, to make science more approachable. And also mm -hmm. currently a judge for NASA space apps. <laughs> so. Amazing, thank you. Um, so just a reminder to everyone watching, please feel free to submit questions throughout. Our panelists would love to hear from you. Um, but I guess I'll kick things off with a starting question. Um, so what inspired you to get involved with the space industry? Like, What sparked your passion for space? Does anyone want to go first? I can go. Um, so I've always been into space um, since I was little, but I actually had a different calling. So I went to Adler Planetarium, fell in love there. Parents bought me a telescope, the traditional story. However, um, life had different plans because I am a great dancer. And so I wanted to be Beyonce's choreographer, which I have a story on that, which I'll tell at a later date. And so um, I want to be Beyonce's choreographer and it just didn't work out after high school. And so I um, was looking to open my own business and dance studio. And this is where the time of the U.S. economy was just going haywire. And so I couldn't like do what I wanted to do. And I um, ended up switching my major to chemistry because I thought I wanted to become a forensic chemist. Um, from that point, I just... When I got to Chicago State, I saw that they had like um, something NASA related. And I said, oh, it'll be cool if I interned at NASA. Well, that ended up happening. So, um, and it was one of the, the best experiences that I had. So that's how um, I got introduced through a professor of doing astronomy. And so I've just been here ever since. That's amazing. And it, I mean, it's still not too late for you to pursue your love of dance. You could still be Beyonce's choreographer. I think so, too. <laughs> I'll go next. Sure. 
Um, so I was born on Guam because my dad worked for NASA during the Apollo missions. And so me and my brother were both born, born there. So I grew up with Neil Armstrong's autograph to my father on the wall, along with all this other really cool NASA memorabilia. And so as a kid, I really loved military aviation. I wanted to, I mean, Top, Top Gun came out when I was 16, you know, um, but just the whole idea of of becoming a military pilot and then eventually becoming a shuttle commander because I grew up in the shuttle era and watching, I mean, every time a shuttle launched, we got to watch it on TV and I just thought, oh, wow, that's really cool. But back then, if you wore glasses, then you couldn't be a military aviator. And so I always saw my path to the stars through that kind of lens, that narrow lens. And so I just kind of did my thing and lived my life as a scientist and getting my degrees and traveling. But I also got my scuba certification and I traveled and taught around the world and I got my pilot's license and I did kind of all of these things. Um, and then I, I did also do a program at Kennedy Space Center called the um, Space Life Science Training Program, where I was a mentor to undergrad students that came and we spent two months at Kennedy Space Center. And that was another thing where I was like, oh, I remember this. I, I miss being in the space area. And so a friend, when NASA was looking for astronauts, sent the call saying NASA is looking for astronauts, you should apply. And I looked at the application and I realized that I had most of the application I qualified for except for speaking Russian. But I, instead of talking myself out of it, uh, because that's what we can do a lot of times, we can say, well, I'm not, why would they ever pick me? <laughs> I'm just a community college professor. And I don't have this big resume and all of those kinds of things. But I thought, oh, you know, I might as well apply and let somebody else make that decision. And so I ended up going all the way to the yes, no phone call. And uh, I got the no phone call from Sunita Williams. So it's always good when an astronaut calls to tell you, no, you're not going to be an astronaut. But I got to meet a lot of astronauts and the experience really changed my life and put me on this new path. And so the last, not quite 10 years, I've been doing a lot more in the space sector, specifically human space flight, but it really rekindled my love from when I was a kid. Amazing, thank you. Anyone else? Um, I, I'll go next. Um, so I think it's interesting that Ashley was also kind of in the arts because that's kind of where I went. Um, my first major was music and I was studying um, piano performance and flute performance. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a musician because you know, people, when I was in grade school, people kind of talked me out of you know, going into STEM. And so after my first year, um, the school I was at dropped my major and I had no money. And so I went to um, North Carolina Central University and they were like, if you can you know, pass your classes, we can give you a stipend and you can study physics. And I was like, well, I'm gonna study physics. And so that's kind of how I got back into science. But as a child, I wanted to be an astronaut, but I kind of have a balance disorder. So I don't like being off of the ground and I don't really like um, flying either. Um, so, you know, that kind of dwindled, you know, along the way as well. But yeah, I just wanted to kind of add that because of what Ashley said. <laughs> So I have a similar story to Dr. Proctor. Um, we, um, I basically got into science when I was like very young. I was about like five when my cousin came over from the States who was studying engineering. And he, one day we had a little like child telescope and he told me like all the random constellations in the sky. And then I got really confused by this one that was like flashing and kind of moving. And then he told me that's the ISS and then explained what it was and that people could literally live there. And then so I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. And then so that was in my mind the whole time growing up. And I realized I liked physics in sometime in secondary school, but I didn't end up finishing high school in like the conventional way and ended up not really knowing how to like continue that dream. And then I did a science course for one year, and then I ended up getting onto um, 
get her into UCL for, yeah, for geophysics, earth sciences and stuff. And it was still like quite earth-based, so science, but earth-based. But I realized as I was going along, I still like space <laughs> and that I could still, I still am kind of studying space because the atmosphere, like the exosphere, they're all quite, like related anyway and our pla our planet is a planet so I was like okay I still want to study that and then so I ended up working in second year as I said for FDL NASA and realized like actually everything they're doing is earth sciences they're all doing like planet um, earth observations there's a lot of earth in space <laughs> um, and I basically ended up still riding that and finding lots of people that were in the space community in London, especially with um, Anishka and her other co-founders, um, London Space Drinks every like month, I think it was, yeah, it was every month. And I met quite a lot of people and yeah, continuing. And now I'm studying astrophysics and I've done lots of things with NASA and stuff and it's kind of gone well. <laughs> um, so I, I guess a good follow on from, um, from that question is, being a black person in such a white dominated sector, I mean, across STEM, across all the sciences, um, it, it's very white dominated. So have you faced any barriers? Um, and if so, how did you overcome them to, you know, continue pursuing your love of space? I'll start with that. Um, since I think I'm the oldest, <laughs> uh, I, you know, the, I didn't, my entire academic, my entire schooling i've never had a black female science um you know role model i've not had one teacher that was a black female scientist and so it's one of those things where you have to find your own way and then a lot of it has also been that in be a geo being a geoscientist i didn't have a lot of other people of color in my classes and so it's oh it was always um, I was one, <laughs> just me. And so expectations, I think this whole, you know, you have to work twice as hard. My parents kind of instilled that in me that you have to do it better than everybody else because they're just waiting for you to mess up or fail um, to say, uh-huh, so see, we knew you didn't have what it takes kind of mentality. And I remember going um, to grad school and you, what you don't know, you don't know. And so my parents, neither of my parents had college degrees and then going off and um, my mom was a, a housewife and my father passed away when I was 19. And so applying to grad school, I was like, I didn't even know. I was like, wait, I got to take this GRE thing. And I just remember kind of showing up and getting into um, Arizona State University and showing up and not knowing, you know, w what even grad school was about and trying to figure that out and, and just kind of having that feeling that none of the professors expected me to do well. And they didn't, the expectations were very low. And my undergrad degree wasn't in geology. So that I was coming in without having a geology degree and being uh, you know, like the first black female, right? <laughs> and so they were just, I think they saw it as a, we're going to let you in diversity wise. And I remember one of my professors saying to me one day that um, we were doing field camp and I was like a mapping queen. I was out there. I'm like, I'm like, I'm in my element. Let me just map this out for you and show you how it's done people. And, and he was like, Cyan came alive, you know, like she, she did really well as it was this big surprise. And I was like, oh, okay. So this is how it is. And now it's funny because I just did a sabbatical at Arizona State University and to come back as a visiting professor and to, they're like, would you like a corner office as a visiting professor? I'm like, yes, I will take that. Um, and running into my old professors who were just like, hey, Cyan, as if, they're surprised that, um, you know, now they're like, own you <laughs> because they're like, yeah, we have, look, this is a success story here, but not feeling that support while going through the system. It, so that's, that was been my story so far. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a story that would be relatable to quite a few people, you know, feeling, I guess, underestimated uh, and not having the support that other other people have. Um, yeah. A- Ashley, did you have something to add to that? Yes, I wanted to add to everything that Dr. Proctor just said, because so I study. So here in America, we have um, HBCUs, which is historically black colleges and universities and PBIs, predominantly black institutions. So I attended a PBI that people often confuse as an HBCU. And we just like, okay, we deal with it. So I was used, so we have, um, I was used to seeing black professors. Um, I had my first black um, chemistry professor at Chicago State University. And I've also had, but the the, the department, like the way the department is, is, it's not like the typical department and so when people hear me say that they're like why and I'm like oh the physics side is like black and latinx and they're like wait what we got one token white guy and they're just like wait that's not how it works and so um what I'm extremely grateful for that however 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 y'all know it's a however I came in very non-traditional they've never seen anything like what I was doing before so nobody knew what the heck I was doing. And so I came in and I said, when I when I realized that I wanted to do astrochemistry, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to be an astrochemist. Okay, well, if you want to do astro, change your major to physics. No, you're listening, but you didn't hear me. And so um, I ended up graduating, becoming the first black astrochemist at Chicago State University. And we believe I'm the first black um, woman astrochemist in the state of Illinois. And so currently there's no black women in astrochemistry with a PhD in the US. And so the first one will graduate this school year, uh, Ms. Jamila Pegues over at Harvard and she'll be the first one at Harvard with an astronomy degree. And so one thing that I faced and um, I try to make this network of blackness and and black women and just in general is that I've noticed like some of the barriers were, um, well, we think that you're a better science communicator. So we want you to focus on SciCom and don't go to grad school for astrochemistry. And that's something that I've been told. And yes, that is my cat hollering for whatever reason. And so, um, you know, I've been told do SciCom because you know, you're so good at it. But don't do astrochemistry. And so I was, just, I was, you know, obviously, this came from someone I trusted. And I was just like, wow, like, really? And even like when you're applying to grad school and going through the steps, and if they say that they believe in you, but they can't help you get there, it also takes a mental toll on your body which I just went through that whole situation and had to revamp how I like how I'm I'm thinking about grad school and thinking about who I'm connecting with because there are people who have this white saviorism complex but they do not want to help us really they just want it on their CVs and so I definitely when Dr. Proctor said oh they're smiling in my face just now see let me tell you something I would just say it's Dr. Proctor to you see when I get my PhD, I'm gonna be like, if I get two PhDs, it's doctor, doctor. <laughs> oh, you know, they can't take it away from you. I tell you, I'll tell you. This, I not if one quick story about that is that seven, six years into my PhD, I was done. I had a, you know, my, three main professors, two white male and one white female. Uh, but my main professor was also my master's. Um, advisor. And so then, and I tell you, no real good support to the point where other people pointed out to me, they're like, really, that's your advisor, (laughs) you know, Um, and where I could just see that I wasn't being treated the same. And I I got to the point where I, I just couldn't take it anymore. And so I went to my first professor, I'm done, I'm quitting after six years, you know, five, six years, something like that. And he was like, okay, bye. And then I went to the next one, um, and I said, I'm done. I can't take it anymore. You know, you won. I'm, you, you got me out of this. And he was like, see ya. And then I went to the female 
And I was like, that's it. I'm done. You know, and she was the, the, the third add on. So she wasn't my main one. The other two were geologists. She was a cognitive psych, psychology, uh, cognitive um, learning psychology kind of thing. And so I, and she just looked at me and she said, hell no, you're not done. You're now my student. <laughs> Here's your office. And I was done in a year. She took me in, mentored me, and that was the first time in my whole academic career at the very end that I experienced what it was to be truly mentored by somebody. And that's, and, what, I got um, this past, and that's what I got this past summer at NASA. So I only had it, I've had quite a few advisors, but I've had one of which when I told her that some things didn't fall through and I'm looking at this one X, Y, and Z, and I'm doing this. And she said, because I, I did an internship at Harvard, and she said to me, you're not leaving, are you? And I was just like, no, why would I leave? She was like, okay, just making sure you ain't leaving. So, and, you know, she got me to NASA, right? And then when I spoke with my other advisors um, at NASA, they said, okay, we got to figure out a game plan for you. And And, and that's what a lot of black students need. I always typically want to hone in and say get two advisors. I had one for my senior thesis defense. And let me tell you, I didn't get any help. And she is well known, by the way. But I didn't get any help from her. Like I didn't get it was do you have my results? No. Okay, well, we're not talking. And sometimes they will use you because you have a black face as well. It helps them. And so I don't want that type of mentorship. I want people to know what my learning style is. I want people to know, like, if I don't say anything in like a week, okay, she's drowning. Let me go save her. I want people to know, you know, we, you know, as black people, as black people, specifically black women in these space sectors, in these educational realms, we get hit harder mm -hmm. because we're seen as strong we're seen as resilient and all these different things however we get hit much harder because they feel like we don't belong and we do yeah i think what you've all said it's so mentors are so important they make such a big difference um and 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 seeing other people that uh, i mean specifically um, women who are, are mixed or black um, I mean looking around my lecture theatres when I'm at uni I don't see many people that look like me um, I don't know about you Chanel I know you're in a similar situation um, how how does is that a barrier in yourself that like it you don't have people around you that you sort of relate to in that way yeah so for me it's very similar like I was in a geology based well, geosciences um field for my bachelor and there were I think three other black women in my class all three of them were international so the university were getting a lot of money out of them um and they I absolutely adore all three of them but also there wasn't that there's not that many for a big class you know so everyone had their own groups and stuff and you can't just force yourself to be in a group of black women. <laughs> so we we were all very close friends when we were at parties and everything would socialize and stuff, but it still wasn't that many as a percentage to be able to say like, we are a significant amount of this course. Um, I personally, as I got older, like not older, but as I progressed throughout the course, realized that they that wasn't just the pattern in my class it was also the year above and the year below they tended not to for some reason have many black people in the classes and especially if they were from england they would be mixed race like myself or like the other people that were in the like year below and year above but i basically again i as soon as i got into the space industry and started working with people i was seeking that sort of mentorship that I didn't get to see in my like in my classes and stuff. I never had any professors that looked like me remotely. Like they were all quite, yeah, no, they were all like middle-aged white men. Like it's, it, London, it's UK. So 
and I shouldn't have to say it's London UK because there are a lot of black people in London UK. Um, but you science boy. Ooh, geology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like in my first year, I basically had something that wasn't necessarily to do with me. Well, it definitely wasn't to do with me being black, but I broke my ankle in the summer before I went to uni. And so I really like I literally could not walk. I had to relearn how to like walk and stuff at the first like term. And so geosciences and having to do field trips, that was another disadvantage that was just like thrown into the mix. And so my first year was very, very tough. And then I did find support in actually one of my friends, I'm gonna just say her name, Faye. She was like, she's from Trinidad and she was an international student inside my class, also a black woman. She actually like, she got me through a lot. Uh, my family also got me through a lot, but I didn't do well my first year, obviously. After like having to do that much and like trying to remain on top of everything, also trying to be above everything because also as a black woman, you have to be above as well. I didn't do well my first year. And that's why my second year, I ended up changing courses and like finding a way to negotiate it because I started off with a physics stream and then had to go more towards a sciences stream, but I still managed to convince them to let me into the physics courses. Um, but I got told multiple times by different professors, and I'm not saying this as a whole of the Earth Sciences Department, because they were actually really, really lovely type of familial people. But I was told multiple times that, are, are you chasing this physics dream still? Or yeah, basically stuff along those lines, so many times. And then eventually I applied for astrophysics and I told a few people that and they were like, really, are you sure? <laughs> but yeah, no, I am now studying astrophysics in Barcelona, but it, I found role models outside of uni. Unfortunately, I couldn't find them in university. There weren't anyone that necessarily had a similar story to myself. So when I did start going to London space drinks, in fact, Nushka, the one that is in charge of, well, one of the people in charge of London Space Network. She, like, she's one of my, she is literally my mentor. I think of her like that. And she's not black, but she's an Indian lady in London, um, a bit older than me. And I can, I can ask her for any type of advice and she can relate to it, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, role models. So, so important. So important. Um, Hayley, did you have anything to add regarding barriers or if you don't have anything, we can move on to the next question. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that everyone has said. And the one thing I think I'll add is that like, so as we're going through our education, we're always taught to like, it's a, we're used to being the only one. And so one thing that I think looking back is so important is if you're not being like, nurtured and you're not progressing and people are not treating you the way you deserve to be treated sometimes it's okay to leave because I learned like even outside of my bubble like I thought I was where I wanted to be and I just had to be there but like right outside you know I didn't even realize it but there were people who were going to be able to foster me and treat me a little bit better and that would have changed my experience as a whole just like looking back I agree with that. I, I wish that I'd had the insight to um, realize that earlier, that uh, there are, were people, uh, and again, it, it was a little bit harder it, to find people back when the internet wasn't like the, the big thing it is now and resources, but um, I've been pleasantly surprised that there are others out there who were doing geoscience and geology, women, black women, um, and but we just couldn't connect. And, and so now that that is a thing, it's so important that you have the resources that you can reach out and build the network that you want to have. And, and one of the things that I love is that we're all connected through Twitter and here we are now actually chatting. Uh, and that's just amazing to me that technology is allowing us to connect in ways that we weren't able to before and build the communities that provide us the support we need to be successful. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and we've actually had a, a question in that I think fits in quite well. Um, so how do you um, how do you recognize when you are being treated differently um, based on your race or the color of your skin? Um, and how do you manage um, to see the discrimination? How do you 
I guess, deal with it um, when it's so commonly gaslit, like people gaslighting you, saying that your experiences aren't valid or, oh, it's not down to race. Um, so, yeah, how, how do you personally deal with that? So I would like to say that, for one, I can identify when it's to do with race, when I see that they don't treat other people the exact same way. If I see people that are, say, a woman but not Black, or I, I'll say like a man that is like, I can see when it's targeted towards a certain type of discrimination. And I'm sure like the other women here can say the same thing, but the way in which I deal with it, I, it may not even be the best way for everyone. It's kind of by just like rising above it, just literally not letting them see that you're affected by it for one, but also sh just showing, not even purposely showing it to them, but living your truth and making sure that you are the best version of you and that their comments can't affect you. They're nothing to do with your life. That's their burden to deal with rather than yours, you know? So that's how I deal with it, at least. Uh, I like to say that for me, um, sometimes it, because I went to a predominantly black institution, they have the thing of exceptional black. And so when that come in, because I had the lower GPA, however, I'm a, what did the professor say? I was really good at science communication. So I was able to put myself out there in ways that other students could not, that I used my gift as my gift as multiple people in the institution that said, like, you have a gift. And so um, when things happened for me and when people could not, come through like they said they would, or when they would treat other students a little bit better than I did. And um, like Chanel said, you rise above it. However, we know I'm a very vocal person. <laughs> I will come to your office and we're gonna have this conversation. That's what we're gonna have. And so um, I'm a little bit older, so I'm not gonna be like, oh, I'm not gonna go cry about it and et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes, depending on the situation. But I will, we will have this conversation and we won't have it again. And so um, in addition and in, in, in addition to this, um, we need to have these conversations because these are now streaming um, here in the US, a bunch of call to actions. I don't know if a lot of people saw that over the summer, but there were a bunch of call to actions to improve more black and brown people in these classroom, in these spaces. And so, um, um, doing that and also, again, if they said I'm so good at science communication and I am I can get all these internships and so on and so forth, I just let that show up. And so um, when Black and Kim actually just had, was featured in Nature, I was just like, hello. <laughs> what, what, what did you say? What was that you said? So it definitely, um, some of the work that we've done, um, and the work that I've done was I, I let it shine. And so um, I am very much proud of the the movements and everything that everyone has been involved in and how we're working together as a community because we will not let each other fail or fall. And so that is something um, what I do. And I typically run to my mentors too. And then they're like, okay, well, we know what we got to do. <laughs> Any other points on that, on um, advice for someone who struggles to recognize discrimination and um, how to cope with being gaslit? Well, I think that, you know, the point, uh, it, when you start feeling like there's something off, that's your first clue. And then again, looking for the other ways and other students are being treated. And I remember that very distinctly of being like, you know, why doesn't my advisor like me? I don't understand, you know, <laughs> like in that feeling. And then, and then we're waiting to be validated because I was taught not to make waves. I was taught to not speak up, you know, like be, don't step out of line uh, because both of my parents grew up half of their lives in segregation. And so thinking about their experiences and what um, they had to put up with just to survive because, um, 
you know, they were in a, a, a literally dangerous situation where if you stepped out of line, you could end up dead. And, and so that kind of mentality of, of observing, but not speaking up um, necessarily because until you're at the breaking point, it's that whole idea of being resilient and having grit and determination. And a lot of black people, I think, or especially black women, you tell me I can't do it. Well, I'm going to show you that I can do it. And so when I was feeling like that I wasn't being treated the same, it was really gr grit, you know, bear it, get through it, show them that you can. Right? But, you know, confirmation when I had my um, white geology colleagues, um, students, other students, who would be like, would, they would see the interaction of me and my advisor and his other graduate students. You know, one blatantly, we were in England. I, ironically, we were at, an, uh, at a conference in, at Oxford and my one friend came from a different school and saw us um, interacting. And she was like, I can't believe that's your advisor. They, the way he treats you is horrible. And I was like, oh, you see it too. It's not just me. And she, she was like, oh, yeah, it's terrible. And I, and that was like the, oh, okay, validate it. Um, because again, trying to find those allies and, and the people who can see that situation and help you see the clarity of that you're not just making this stuff up that others see it too. And I feel like now that there's the voice for that, there's the platform for that, and there's the allies for that. And so you can definitely go out and get that support that you need and determine what is happening in that situation. I just wanna add on that, literally that last sentence is the best way I think to deal with this type of discrimination or gaslighting is to find your allies. It is literally to find your allies to find your colleagues that look like you, is to find a group that you can say, is this normal? How I'm getting treated, is it normal? And what should I be, do about it? Give me different ways to look at it and different points of view on how to deal with it. So yeah, I think that that's literally the best way to deal with it. Otherwise, I know, I personally, if I go to a professor and speak to them straight to their face, I feel like they could use some sort of, thing to put you down and make it even harder for you at university. So I feel like having someone to talk to, to actually tell you whether it's like safe for you to do something, I think that's the best way. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and a extremely relevant question that's just come in is, um, what do you think is the best way for non-black students or academics to help create a better environment for black students at university? Um, Hayley, would you like to kick us off with this? Um, I think the most important thing is like to like literally just learn how to be a good ally because so many times it's like if I say something, you know, instead of people saying, oh, you know what, she's right. People are like, ooh, that was sassy, you know, and like that's so problematic and it's like or they want to center themselves. It's like I know how to step back, you know, and I feel like that's the biggest part for people who are not black. Like we have to learn how to step back and give each other space and just stand up for each other. Because if the whole class is like, hey, that was inappropriate, it makes a difference. You know, cause even the teacher, you know, if they're not, if it's like a, a bias they're not aware of, you know, maybe they'll check themselves, you know, I would like to think, but you know, I, I'm not quite sure cause I haven't actually had that experience, unfortunately. I would agree with, uh, you know, look, be a voice for change. <laughs> and I, and I, I say this all the time to when I see something wrong and I'm the one who has to, to point it out. Why do the black people always have to point it out? <laughs> You're and especially when it comes to access to things like, like a panel um, or a conference where it's all white. And I'm like, now I always check. I'm like, if they don't have a diverse lineup of speakers, you know, listed on the website, I'm like, you're not getting my money. And then if I find a friend on there, I'm like, why aren't you saying something? Look at this, <laughs> you know, speak up and say, hey, 
you know, this panel is a little lopsided. Maybe we should go out there and find, you know, a person of color. They do exist. And now it's easier than ever because we have the hashtags. <laughs> you can find people. Uh, and so I, I'm always baffled now when there is a big conference in the space industry and they can't find a, you know, a black woman of color, you know, like, a, a, or a person of color. Um, I, that blows my mind and nobody has said anything. Yeah, it shouldn't always be a black people's responsibility to call people out on things, anything. It, it shouldn't always, it like a good ally should be able to call people out for doing problematic things. No, it, you know, it's about that just, equitable, diverse, inclusive world, like in the Jedi space, right? How do we create that and promote that? And if we don't have, if we don't work together um, to do that, then it's not going to happen. And so it's just as important for us to find our voice to uh, stand up and promote this. We need our our white colleagues, our other students, our our mentors, everybody else to also stand up and and move towards this vision of uh, of the Jedi space. So I was going to say, One thing. Oh. <laughs> go ahead, Ashley. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out, um, I I guess I've been doing social justice for quite some time. Um, allyship, but not white saviorism. And that is the problem. A lot of people are like, I can save you. No, shut up and sit your ass down. We need someone that's going to actually help, you know, because everybody can say this online but not back the actions. I can tell you quite a few people in that Twitterverse that I know personally that I would be like, mm, okay. But it, it it's definitely, we definitely have to be careful with the word allyship. And one, a good uh, mentor friend of mine, Dr. Lucienne Walkowicz, hates being called an ally. That's how you know it's a good one. Because they are like, don't call me that. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. You know, people like, when you hear people say that, that means they don't, that means they, they're they consistently doing it. This is what they do every day on the daily basis. Um, also, when non-Black people ask this question, Google works. It's not our job to tell you what you should and shouldn't do, what you can and can't do. There's a bunch of books out there. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of literature. You know, just start looking at things that make black people uncomfortable. And look within yourself. Start with the person in the mirror first. Um and so oh, I forgot it was a really another important base I was gonna hit home with. But it's definitely um important to see these things. And this is why Black and Astro existed. Oh, what I was going to say. If anyone notices, all the Black in weeks were started by Black people. That should not have happened. If we mean so much to you, if our lives matter so much, why are we creating this space for ourselves? And that's something my best friend has said. She's like, well, why do we do all this? It took us to bring this up and bring this out. Now I want to see the work because it was cool in the summertime. Now we're applying to grad school fellowships, job, faculty positions, industry-based positions, space positions. I want to see your money where your mouth is. Exactly. I was going to say something very, very similar about the fact that the literature is out there. The hashtags are out there. You should, it's not, no, it's not non-white people's goal or role in general to make sure that white people know how to act. <laughs> Reading books, going on the hashtags, just making sure that you listen to other people's stories as well. Just hear the experiences and don't say, are you sure that's because you're black? Just say like, oh yeah, okay, that's what you're experiencing. I'm going to listen to that because that's your experience, not mine. And I'm going to take it on and I'm going to try and make sure that my friends, my family aren't acting like that to you. 
that's literally the bare minimum <laughs> you know but yeah yeah no I agree very much with everything that um everyone has said right now thank you so much for sharing all your experiences um and actually we've had a question um would any of the panelists be happy to share their social media info for um any black female students in astro in need of advice and community um i know you're all very active on twitter um would you be happy to share your twitter handles sure <laughs> Go ahead, Cyan. well that's one of the things i'm at dr cyan proctor but one of the things that i was had to check myself on was well, when I was doing Twitter and, and, you know, Black Lives Matters happened and I started looking at my feed and I realized that I was not following because I was following all these aerospace people, but I was missing all of the black in Astro and the all the black in STEM people. And so I consciously went in and diversified my stream. And, and then I told others, like, and so that's one thing that you can do. You want to be an ally and you want to learn more, diversify. <laughs> diversify your Twitter stream and your Facebook group and your LinkedIn and your and um, your Instagram of who you follow. Step out of that narrow zone and expand using the hashtags that are readily available. And I was like, you know, started doing the hashtags. And I'm like, oh my goodness, look at these are my peeps, all these black people who are in science and technology, engineering and math. I'm like, I've got to follow all of you. And, and so that's made a big difference just for me. And so I can't even imagine how it will open up uh, a person that isn't of color's world. My handle is that underscore Astro underscore chick without the K because Twitter was being cheap. So, um, um, so obviously we have black and Astro, we have black and Kim, we have black and physics. And then also we have black women and this is to the panelists too. We have black women plus in a strong physics and astronomy group, Facebook group that um, specifically for black women, black identifying women only. Um, which is amazing. I found that, um, I found the group and I was just like, oh, okay, it's a community here. And it existed, right? And um, which I found so much joy in that. And, and I talked to a lot of the women almost every day. Um, also, um, going back to Cyan's point about um, broadening um, your scope and your view. Also with the Black and X Weeks, Y'all know we had celebrities promoting this. Now, look, my future ex-husband, baby daddy, Michael B. Jordan, you know, congratulated me. And I was just like, you know, <laughs> he congratulated me on my NASA talk. So, you know, I will never forget that moment. So, yes, follow all the Black and Weeks. There is a lot of things going on. I was actually talking to my family the other day about Dr. Proctor. You actually made a Twitter like message with like a group message and then MC Hammer was in it and I told my parents like oh today I was just in a like group chat with MC Hammer and like honestly there are the celebrities are interested in it it's not it's not just like the black women in space community that are interested in black women in space like that it's interesting we are interesting people because for some reason society hasn't shown us before now other than like when uh, I forgot the movie of Taraji B. Henson, you guys know exactly who I'm talking hidden about. Hidden figures. There you go, hidden figures. I before that, no one really spoke about black women in the space industry. Like even oh, though right. there was Macy Jemison, Jemison, like there was all these other people that came before us, but for some reason we weren't spoken about at all. So I am so appreciative that I found you guys on Twitter, and yeah. Really and I've got to say that, you know, just to, to build, uh, build off of that, you know, um, it was uh, Katie Coleman who gave this shout out the other day to um, a lot of, uh, you know, people of color, black following, and um, for, to get that from an astronaut, which was fantastic. But <laughs> NASA, and, and this is why one of the things where we have to speak up is they have not done a very good job with their black female astronauts. I mean, they have a 50% success rate. And so when we're talking about role models and your chances of being selected as a black astronaut and um, going to space and when um, 
when Jeanette Epps was in Russia and they pulled her and everybody's like, what's going on here? And now she's finally been reassigned to go up. But there, you know, at the ISS, not a lot of people of color up on the ISS in the history of it being up there. And so being able to get that representation and why it matters. And I remember, I, I just want to throw this out here, when I was going through the astronaut selection process, um, I remember we had a, a, a group like mingling with astronauts and stuff. And I had my my hair, you know, and I had longer hair and I had it out and, and I let it out. And I was like, oh, I'll be fine, right? I walked into that room and you know that feeling you get where people kind of turn and you, you're you like, and I was like, ooh, may, and I felt that, oh, maybe I put out too much black <laughs> out there. Like, like, let me pull this back and let me straighten it and, and get all, you know, but I could feel it like as just, I felt like an alien walking through that room. Um, I was the only um, black female in the, well, I might've been, I'm trying to think if I was, I wasn't the only black person, but I was the only black female. And just feeling that, like, did I just do something wrong? Did I just uh, put a bad check mark next to me because of um, just having me be out there, the natural kind of look and stuff. And keep in mind, this was 10 years ago. This was 2009, um, 2000. And so it, it's, yeah. Um, so my point is that finding our voice and being who we are and supporting each other through these networks is so important to change the way we are perceived, especially as Black women in space. Are there any final hashtag? Oh, sorry, any handles that want to be shared? Because um, unfortunately, We've run out of time for questions, but if um, Haley or Chanel, do you have? Did you want to share your Twitter handles? So my one is Chanel C H A N E I L underscore James. Um, I just wanted to quickly add a little onto Go what for it. Said, but yes, it's very hard to find the balance of I want to be myself as a black woman, but I also don't want to be scrutinised for being that same black woman, and it's very hard to find that balance. And I feel like people are starting to be more accepting and that we are having more of a platform to show that even though we're black women, we can still be a black woman and into space sciences at the same time. We don't need to like blend down anything and we can be exactly who we are. And yeah, again, finding those networks on the internet and everything has kind of like helped that. And I wanted to shout out my little sister and brother, Sienna and Sebastian. <laughs> because they're literally watching right now and they have a completely different outlook to even what I experienced. They are seeing different like programs on Netflix with like black little children scientists or getting to see lots of different like gem general diversity in social media is so important. And my last little thing that I wanted to say was try and reach out to other black, black voices. That's literally it. Just try and listen to black voices. <laughs> Amazing. Oh yeah. Thank so you. my my Twitter, sorry, is underscore underscore stellar with four A's. But yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, I mean, hopefully people will see your amazing Twitter feeds and they'll be inspired. Cause I mean, you're all very active on Twitter. So I'm sure people have a treat going through that. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that was the last question that we had time for. Honestly, I had so many more questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, I mean, this panel could have been three times as long as it was. But um, thank you so much for the submissions, for questions. Um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all the panellists. It's been really lovely talking to you today. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, it's been really interesting to hear about all your different journeys and the projects you've been working on. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended um, and for all the fantastic questions. Um, I hope you have found this useful. Um, yeah, again, I encourage you to check out Astro Noir. It's a really great website. Um, also, we really do value your feedback um, and would be very grateful if you could take the time to fill out the short feedback form beside this webinar. Um, to find out more about all the episodes in the series and the other events we run, follow UK Sets and spacecareers.uk on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and sign up to the UK Sets newsletter via ukseds.org.
Once again, thank you for watching everyone um, and please join us again for another webinar on careers in the space sector. Thank you.